Uh, one of the most known and remarkable uh, guys in the community, uh, author of several books, uh, co-founder of Erlang Solutions, uh, and enjoy this talk. He, he's going to talk yeah. about the past, present, and future uh, about Erlang. Francesco is one of the Probably it might be the person that knows more about Erlang, how Erlang uh, started, uh, how Erlang has evolved during the time, and so on. So enjoy this talk. Thank you. So, before starting off, I actually you know, wanted to, uh, to thank uh, Gabriel, Brujo, Cesar, Carlos, and all of the organizers for having me. And I've had a great time you know, coming. Uh, it's the first time in Colombia, uh, and it's just been an amazing experience. So a big round of applause to them. It's, uh I love it also when Brujo blushes. It's <laughs> But no, um, you know, building a community you know, takes a huge effort, and I think starting with conferences is very, very brave, but it's great to see a community now which is, is, it has come together, and uh, you know, I think it's a start of a great, something really, really great. So the talk is called you know, Two Steps Forward, you know, One Step Back, and it, it's, you know, if we look at it, as the developer ecosystem has developed you know, in the last 25 years. So as Carlos said, you know, I've seen kind of the history, I've seen this evolution. Um, what we've seen, you know, what I've seen out there is that we've often gone out and reinvented the wheel. And often we've reinvented it, not round, but square. And it, it's, uh, you know, and so whilst the industry is progressing, uh, I mean, the hardware on which we're building things has progressed a lot in the last 25 years. The chipsets has progressed, operating systems have progressed, infrastructure has progressed. You know, we're always taking two steps forward, but it's not always forward, and it's not going as fast as we should have. You know, sometimes we do stop and take a step back. And in here, you know, I'm going to actually come in and share some of these experiences. And in some cases, even frustrations. Um, quick round of hands. How many of you here are students? One, this is, okay. Th there's a few of you uh, there. Um, this was me as a student. Um, this was actually the first badge, uh, you know, the first kind of internship I got. It was a badge at Ericsson uh, at the Computer Science Laboratory. And you're still students, so, um, don't take this personally because you haven't graduated yet. But you know, I was about to graduate here, and when you're that age, um, before you start getting gray hairs, uh, you think you know absolutely everything until you learn something new. But then you know absolutely everything <laughs> until you learn something new. And 25 years on, um, I'm still learning, and I'm still you know trying to figure it all out. And you know, and I'll be sharing this journey in my talk, in, in this particular talk. So, if we think of it, you know, Erling's had an excellent track record at kind of predicting the future and, you know, being ahead of its time. And, you know, to quote, w one of the reasons I think, you know, it's been ahead of its time is that when they went in and invented Erlang, they set out to solve a problem. They set out to solve a problem of, you know, how do we develop scalable and resilient systems. So, you know, think server-side systems now. Um, and they did this, you know, um, before the web. So they did this at the time when, you know, the only systems which had to be scalable and could never fail were telecom systems. And, you know, we usually say that, you know, Erlang is a programming language designed for the internet age, even though it predates the web. And it's also a language designed for multi-core computers, even though you know, it predates them too. And you know, if you look at you know, the very, very early adopters, they were not companies, they were universities. You know, back in 1991, universities were actually picking up Erlang, and they were picking up Erlang not to teach a programming language, and that's really, really important. They were actually teaching Erlang to teach some aspects of computer science be it, um, well, parallelism, being, uh, you know, being parallel programming, being uh, operating system programming, I've seen it used with artificial intelligence, and many, many others. And 
you know, that is more or less the time you know, when I started getting into Erlang itself. And you know, what really made it interesting, you know, and I think this is a great you know, quote from uh, Samuel Payton Jones, it's a beacon language, and uh, more clearly than other languages, demonstrates the benefit of concurrency-oriented programming. So you know, there have been a lot of talks, you know, a few have covered concurrency here, but the real trick here is the whole idea that you've got processes, and processes do not share memory. Now, as soon as your process doesn't share memory, that means that you can put two processes on separate machines, on separate computers, and that gives you distribution. As soon as you've got distribution, you can, you know, you can copy the state of these two processes and have two copies of that data. You lose one machine, the other process takes over. Not only, you've got now two processes, you can do twice the work, because you've got two machines. It's, it's a very simple concept, but that is the concept which means that you know, 25 years on, we're still here today you know, talking about it. And once you've solved the problem of distribution, you've also solved the problem of multicore. Because multicore is, in effect, an extension of distributed programming. All you're doing is you're distributing processes on different cores instead of different machines. So you know, this is why you know, it's leading the way uh, in many, many instances. And, you know, and what they were doing was they were trying to solve a problem. The solution happened to be a programming language. I myself you know, came into contact with Ericsson, sorry, with Erlang um, in university. So uh, my university was not the first, but it was one of the first to start teaching it. Uh, and they, were, well, they weren't even teaching it. The teacher came into the room. He waved at the first edition of Programming Erlang, you know, said, this is the book, read it. They waved at some exercises, said, these are the exercises, do them. And then off he went and started lecturing about the theory of the horrors of parallel programming. You know, deadlocks, mutexes, semaphores, you know, shared memory, corrupt memory, and all, all of these things uh, which um, happened. Now, working on these exercises, I had to write, you know, what we had to do was we had to implement a virtual, a simulated world. So a world where you had carrot patches growing, and then you had rabbits going around eating the carrots. And if a rabbit found a carrot patch, it would broadcast all the other rabbits, hey, there's food here, there are carrots, come eat. And all the rabbits would come in and you know, finish off a carrot patch. And then you'd have wolves roaming around, and if a wolf would see a rabbit, it would tell other wolves, hey, there are rabbits here, let's go eat them. And a rabbit would see a wolf, uh, it was a wolf, wolf, and you know, broadcast it to the other rabbits, and then run away. It was, yeah, it, it was a fun exercise to do. It took me about 40 hours, including you know, the graphical interface. We did it in Tickle TK. If anyone you know, wants to, uh, you know, talk about, well, expose your age. Um, uh, it's the last time I've actually used Tickle TK, but uh, yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, it was a really fun exercise. You know, I didn't think much about it. You know, every rabbit was a process, every wolf was a process, every carrot patch was a process. And you know, the goal was to create a balanced world. It took me about 40 hours. Now, a few months later, uh, during uh, our object-oriented programming course, we had you know, the exact same exercise was given to us. We were studying AFL as an object-oriented programming language. And we you know, ended up solving it a slightly different way. The, the teachers decided to pair us up. So two of us ended up taking us 60 hours to solve the problem. So in total, 120 hours, three times longer than what it had taken me to solve the problem on my own. And what did that do? You know, what was, you know, it, 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 it hit me, you know, because not only, I had already solved the problem, I reused a lot of the algorithms, I reused a lot of the ideas, I knew the approach to take, at the end of the day, object-oriented programming, and especially with Eiffel and you know, concurrency, concurrency-oriented programming, are very, very similar. Um, so that's where you know, it, it started hitting me. You know, it taught me that you, know, you need to use the right tool for the job. And if you do, uh, you know, there are huge productivity gains uh, you know, to be had, and that you know, programming languages actually did matter a, a lot. And with that realization, I also realized, OK, Erlang might not be the next mainstream programming language. But you know, I, I started believing that there will be a lot of languages out there which 
you know, would be heavily influenced by a lot of the characteristics around Erlang. And we're seeing that today. We're seeing that 25 years on. Now, in conjunction with that, you know, that's when I decided to go in and apply for an internship at the Ericsson Computer Science Lab. So for those of you who don't know, that's where Erlang was invented. I went in, had an interview with you know, Joe Armstrong, and uh, he said, yeah, come by, have, you know, do your thesis project. And, uh, and you know, I have never looked back. So whilst you know, doing the thesis project, that was more or less the time which um, kind of this coffee you know, uh, started brewing out at Sun Microsystems. Um, not as good as Colombian coffee, <laughs> I have to say. And it was more or less a time when I was at the computer science lab where Mike Williams, so Erlang co-inventor, and Roy Bengtsson, which was to become a future manager at Ericsson, were visiting Sun Microsystems. And they were doing it. It was actually in Facebook's current offices in Menlo Park. And what they were trying to do is to sell Erlang to Sun Microsystems. Hey, you should ship it you know, with all of your Solaris boxes and Sun OS boxes, which you go out. You know, the telecoms, you know, they were big on, uh, on Solaris. You know, they used Solaris everywhere. And you know, they believed there was, a, there, was a, there was a real match. So they were all in this meeting with you know, all of the executives from Sun. And after about an hour, a little piece of paper started going round to all of the execs. And uh, it was lunchtime. So what do they do instead of bringing them out to lunch? They interrupt the meeting. They showed them the door. They thanked them for having flown all the way from Sweden to San Francisco and said bye-bye. A month later, exactly a month later, um, Java was announced and released as open source. And it was at the computer science laboratory where, you know, one, more or less at that, that time, you know, one of my colleagues, uh, Klaus Wikström, uh, goes in and shares the Java white paper with me. And reading it, I got a sense of deja vu. There's a, there's a concurrency model, uh, at the time, uh, you know, the very first kind of version of Java had lightweight threads. They got rid of them, but you know, the very, very early version did. There was a garbage collector, which was, you know, back in 1995, was very, yeah, very unusual. Built-in memory management. Guess what? You know, no more nights in the lab. You know, figuring out, you know, segmentation faults and core dumps and pointer errors, and a virtual machine. Yeah, and that was, again, a novel, very novel thing. And you know, what, was, what, were we, you know, what were we doing at Ericsson with Erlang? We were building uh, soft real-time systems. And what was everyone else around us calling us? Crazy. Because you cannot possibly build a soft real-time system using a virtual machine. It will never be fast. You, know, you write soft real-time systems using C. You know, that, that's what we were being told. And they, they, they believed that this extra layer you know, called the virtual machine would be too slow. Um, they didn't, what they didn't realize was, A, you know, the productivity gains and the ease of development. You tried to explain it, but went to deaf ears. And they did not see the costs either, because with the productivity gains, had you done it in C, you would have ended up implementing anyhow, uh, you know, to quote Robert Verding, a bug-ridden implementation of you know, half of the features in the beam today. And you know, what we actually went out to prove was that you didn't have to be the fastest when implementing software real-time systems. You just had to be fast enough. And not that much later, uh, you know, three major projects within Ericsson were started. Their, um, vo their voice over ATM so solution, so the XD301 switch, their ATM switch, um, which was Ericsson entry into packet-based switching. They implemented uh, the NX project, which was Ericsson entry into broadband. So they had wireless broadband, fiber optics over cable, and ADSL over, over um, you know, copper wires. And the third was their mobile internet. Started off with GPRS. Today, you know it as 5G. And you know, I don't know what infrastructure you have here, but Ericsson has about 40% of all of the world's mobile infrastructure. So there's a 40% chance, if you do have Ericsson here in Colombia, that the IP address assigned to your phone today was given to you by an airline system. So yeah, we, we, we proved them wrong. Uh, 
but it took, it took quite a bit of time. And you know, going in and comparing you know, the JVM to the Beam, um, you know, I think one word comes to mind. I've always said your know, programming languages and programming language ecosystems have to be three things. They need to be predictable. And by predictable, that means two things. You need to look at the code and understand what it does. The second thing is, when you're actually executing that code, you need to, you know, you need to know exactly that every request you know, is going to be executed in the same way, irrespective of when you're running it. And you know, ease of use and you know, ease of maintenance, you know, those come next. But focusing on predictability, that's where, you know, that's where Java you know, kind of started you know, creating issues. Uh, there were two, 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 two major things. Uh, one was the threads versus concurrency. So Java has shared memory, and you know the Beam didn't. Uh, you've got mutable step. You know that that becomes you know concurrency models, different concurrency models, different approaches to them, where you've got mutable state versus immutable state. And as soon as you've got mutable state, as soon as you've got shared memory, you have something called stop the world garbage collection. So that means you can start hitting you know, thousands of requests, you know, to the JVM, it will serve them, it's incredibly fast, it is a fine piece of engineering, you know, incredibly, incredibly fast, but if some poor user gets hit right when the garbage collector triggers, um, for no fault of its own, you know, you can actually uh, stop. And, and looking at, you know, 99, 2000, 2001, you know, you, you had real-time Java, soft real-time Java, where the garbage collector would actually pause for a minute while it was figuring and getting its act together. And that's, again, no fault of the garbage collector. It is no fault of the JVM. It's, it's just the way it's built. It's, it's a programming model. It's, it's the whole you know, shared memory approach. There's no other way around it. I've actually met, um, I was lucky enough to meet the person who implemented uh, the JVM's garbage collector. He's currently working on the Go team. And he had read all of the Erlang papers around the garbage collector. He knew exactly how it worked. And he was very, very envious, you know, that they had a much, much simpler problem to solve, which is per process. It's so easy. And in fact, you know, today, you know, this developer is working on the Go team. And a lot of the ideas he was telling us from the, the early days of from the garbage collector are actually implemented in Go itself. Other things, you know, which the JVM doesn't have is, you know, no, no preemption, there's no tail recursion. And another thing is no monitoring of threads. You, know, you could lose a thread, in idiomatic Java at least, you, know, you lose a thread, you wouldn't know about it. You, you, there's no signals, you need to actually go in and ping it or you know, trying to figure out if something's gone wrong. That's something which, you know, very early on, it's, it's actually the reason why there is concurrency in Erlang today. They realize, you know, they, say, they realize, how do we actually figure out that something is wrong? Well, we need something else to monitor. Okay, so we need two things. All of a sudden, and that's how, you know, they built in the concurrency model into the system. And I think, you know, these are ideas which, you know, came about through conferences, through interaction, but also through their experience. The very, very first version of, you know, the Ericsson radio kind of mobile space stations, you know, they had a Solaris machine with a human being staring at the screen and as soon as the system crashed, they'd go in and restart it manually. <laughs> that was the very, very first release of kind of you know, the mo mo mobile phone networks you know, back in the days. So again, two things. You have a computer and you've got a human being. Let's automate the human being. Uh, it's not fun just to stare at a screen until you know, logs start scrolling and you know something's wrong. Now, fast forward a little bit for, uh, further, and uh, Node.js came along. Came along. And you know, I, you, you've got to know, lo, love Node.js for what it's good at. Uh, in huge, uh, in, in, a, in an old package manager, large number of packages, you can quickly throw together a, a prototype which looks really solid, really, really professional, and really, really professional. But you know, what winds me up with Node is that it was put together, implemented with complete disregard for computer science and technology which had been around for decades. And the example, you know, I think, you know, I'll steal an example from Joe Armstrong. Imagine, 
you've got everyone in the room has a prime number, and you want to go in and to ask Node.js, hey, is this a prime number or not? As long as you've got small prime numbers, you, know, you all get a very fast response back. But there's always a smart ass in the room who will go in and send a huge prime number. <laughs> and as soon as you do, uh, this heavy task will block everyone else. And so you're all there waiting for this huge prime number to, you know, to, to, to actually compute. And, you know, and, and that's, again, you know, it's, it's the same uh, predictability. You lose predictability. It, your, your, your runtime is not predictable anymore. And it's no good that you know, it takes you know, a few milliseconds you know, to, to, you know, to, to set up calls if that little you know, small percentile ends up taking more than what is acceptable, which is, you know, could be a few seconds, if not more. And you know, if you think of it, you know, McCarthy invented time sharing back in the 50s. It's used in mainframe, you know, in mainframe computing. And you know, lots of users would get a slice of CPU time. And you know, your speed depended on how many users were actually using your mainframe, not how computationally intensive their operations were, or the scheduled tasks were. So if we move, hello. OK, so backtracking a little bit to my time at Ericsson. Whoops, sorry. Backtracking a little bit to my time at Ericsson. Uh, 1998 to be exact. Um, one of the very first open source products Ericsson ever released was called Eddyware. Now, this was a time when Ericsson at least, and I think many others believed open source meant here's the source code, don't bug us. And it, 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 but it was so huge, you know, management didn't know what to do with open source. The, you know, Erlang had just been released as open source as well. And you know, it was all based on the whole cathedral and the bazaar paper. And you know, if you've not read it, go out and read it. It's, uh, it's a very interesting analogy over how you know, people's minds worked back then. And what, what they did is Eddyware, so Eddy was this, this open source application. What it did was it was clusterware. It allowed you, so the, the whole idea was that you had lots of computers, you had desktop computers at the time, so Solaris, workstations, Linux desktops, you had, um, you had um, Windows NT machines. And you know, everyone in Sweden usually goes home at 5 o'clock, and all the computers are left on, or all their desks, and that's more or less when America wakes up and starts browsing the web. So the whole idea there was, OK, let's start using this extra processing power, computing power, um, in, in spare capacity in our offices when you know, people aren't working. And so what Eddyware did was, Eddie did was it would start web servers on all of these desktops. It had its own distributed file system, or you could mount the file system. But it actually, you know, using distributed file system, we would then cache you know, files locally. And you know, it would run web servers. So instead of having a dedicated data center, you just use your spare capacity. And you know, it's this orchestration and optimal use of computing capacity, you know, which in my world you know, is almost a predecessor to cloud computing. You'd spin off and tear down uh, services. And indeed, you know, uh, about 2007, that's when I first tried out uh, Amazon you know, EC2. And at the time, you know, Eddie was still very much fresh in our minds because, you know, Erlang web servers were incredibly powerful. You know, I think the big mistake we did was we never understood how to package them so that they could be used as a standalone product, uh, as they had done, for example, with Apache. And so what we did is we went in and on one instance, at the time, you know, there was only one single instance. They might have just uh, released a large instances. So this was the very, very early days. We took one instance and we started off a yours web server, which was just serving, you know, ser serving simple requests. Um, we then started off a second instance where we started the Tsung load tool. And we started you know, trying to get this load tool to send as many HTTP requests as possible to this web server to see how fast it would go. 
And it was, you know, we couldn't get Strong to run any faster. We looked at the CPU capacity of yours, on, of the yours instance, and it was running at 20% CPU. Okay, it's generally a bit more load, it can handle it. We start off another instance and start off the Tsung load tool, start pushing uh, requests to the web server, looked at the CPU capacity on the web server, it was still at 20% CPU. Only thing that, you know, the first load tool, however, had gone, gone from 20% CPU utilization down to 10%. And what was happening here is obviously a network and I.O. were being throttled. And for, for, for a community in which for you know, 10 years had you know, built you know, build telecom switching, handling hundreds of thousands of users on embedded devices with 16 or 32 megs of memory. I don't think, you know, we were very, very impressed at the time. And it was the inability to control the stack which, uh, you know, put us back. And, and it, it was interesting, I think it was two years later, uh, you know, two years later when we ran the first event in uh, San Francisco, the first airline event in San Francisco, where the European airline community met the American airline community. The airline community were all about cloud and scale. <coughs> the European community were still looking at maximizing how much they could get out of a single instance. And still today, you know, uh, you get plagued you know, by your neighbor on the, same, you know, on the same machine having a very computationally intensive job. So, you know, it, it, it's, um, you know the, the whole arguments of lower costs and high throughput are now finally beginning to kick in, 10 years later. And on the same argument, virtualization is another, it's something which at least we in the airline community have never really come to terms with. It's, uh, you know, there are a lot of use cases for virtualization, but, you know, scalability is definitely not one of them. It's, um, I've tried to explain it many, many times, that, and I've struggled to explain it sometimes, that the more layers you add, the more memory your system's going to use, and the slower it's going to run. And you know, the whole idea with virtualization, you know, you've got the beam, the virtual machine, which is in itself an operating system on top of an operating system, which then runs on top of a hypervisor, which emulates an operating system, which then runs on top of an operating system, which then runs on top of the hardware. You know, how many more layers do you want to add? Yeah. More or less in parallel, with that in mind, you know, there was the Ling VM. I don't know how many of you have heard of it. A few of you have. So the Ling VM was an Erlang on Zen instance which ran on a hypervisor on the bare metal, running in a Zen hypervisor on the bare metal, and you could spin it off in, uh, in, about, in a few milliseconds. You could spin off new, you know, new, new uh, Ling VMs. It, it had, you know, it implemented probably 80 to 90 percent of all of the BIFs, you know, but didn't have multi-core built in. So you know, you'd, you'd have a Ling VM per core, in effect. That, that's how it, it would run, and you know, th this is, uh, you know, this is how our, our minds have been kind of wired. Not that way, you know. If you go down that route, you end up melting the polar ice caps. You end up using too much GPU capacity for nothing. Uh, and you end up having to throw even more hardware at the problem. You know, one of the companies who was basically trying to do it on a budget and didn't want to throw hardware at the problem was WhatsApp. In December 2008, you know, 2011, they went in and announced that they had actually had achieved about a million TCP IP connections on a single machine. January 2012, they went in and announced that they'd gone from 1 million to 2 million TCP IP connections on a single machine. Now, to get to those levels, you know, this was in 2012. So that was a while ago. To get to those levels, they had to change the Erlang VM, so they had to make changes in it optimizing it for you know, this level of scale. It was both the concurrency model as well as you know, the whole I.O. And they also had to change FreeBSD. You know, this blog post right here explains you know, a lot of the things they had to do whilst doing it. 
And at the time, it was a company with a very small engineering team. When they got acquired a few years later, I mean, their back-end engineering team consisted of about 10 people. So, um, you know, it, it's, you know, back, you know, in 2011, 2012, even less. But their goal was to optimize the hardware. They wanted to run their services as cheaply as possible. So less hardware you have, the easier it is to maintain, but also, you know, that means you're scaling not only horizontally, but also vertically. And you know, I think a lot of the changes which were made you know, back then, proprietary changes, you know, being released as open source, to be integrated into the Beam. Um, the FreeBSD, I think, operating system in general have also evolved. And yeah, fast forward, you know, three years later, 2015, Phoenix achieved the same results, you know, using an out-of-the-box version of the Erlang VM, of the Beam, and also using a vanilla operating system. And it would actually stop them back then going beyond 2 million TCP IP connections was the network bandwidth. I think they were testing it on Amazon. <laughs> so, <laughs> again, you know, w w with this, you know, um, you know, going back to Andrea's talk earlier today, you know, who needs Kubernetes? Who needs containerization? This level of scale, all you need is two instances. In case, you know, to quote again Joe Armstrong, one of your instances get hit by thunder or by lightning. Um, and I was just came back from Santa Marta, you've got some really impressive thunder and lightning uh, here in Colombia. In case, you know, one of your servers gets hit, you've got a second server to, to, take, to take everything over. But, you know, two million TCP IP connections will handle most of you know, the CPU capacity of, yeah, I think, most of the needs of you know, most of your programs <laughs> out there. Now, if, you know, if we, more or less at the same time, so actually 2015, so 2015 that was at the same time when we'd hit, you know, with a an out, you know, vanilla out of the box implementation of Erlang, two million connections, we were working with Stu Bailey. So he was the CTO and founder of a company called Infoblox in the Bay Area. And it was a research project which we called you know, flow forwarding. And what we did in this particular research project was you know, we took the Ling VM. So by then, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, call it a um, para-virtualized Erlang. So very much like a modern containers, runs without hardware virtualization, and you know, on the bare metal, and you know, takes a few milliseconds you know, to spin off. We had also, as part of this project, implemented what we call an open flow switch, the link switch. It was completely implemented in Erlang, so it was actually doing a lot of the packet switching in Erlang. It had an API as well, and the routing was all, all, all in Erlang. And the reason we picked Erlang was not, again, for speed of execution, uh, the, the eventual idea was to go in and implement it in C, but for speed of development. Uh, we were, I don't know if you were involved at some point in this project, yeah, Carlos was, yeah. Um, what, what, what was happening was, you know, the, 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 there was a standard which was constantly changing, and we, they'd announced a new standard, and probably a week later we'd announced a fully compliant switch with that particular standard. The C version, it took them an extra year. A year later, they went in and announced a fully compliant. So, and so by doing it in Erlang, we were actually able to quickly you know, figure out issues with the standards. We found errors, we found design misses, and so on. But what we did, so we did, what we did is we took the link switch and we embedded it into the link VM. So we'd spin off, and we embedded it into the link VM, and we tapped into the Zen Hypervisor's networking API. So it exposes a networking API, which we tapped into. So we were using that you know, where, where available and doing everything else in, in the Ling VM. So what we're doing, we're spinning off a para-virtualized container, you know, running Erlang with a built-in switch. We then started working on a system called Leviton, which 
handled orchestration. So what it did, it went in and you know, created networks of containers or VMs. It, could, you know, it, was it was a predecessor to Kubernetes. And the whole idea with it is we'd go in and spin off you know, thousands of these instances of the Ling VM, you know, thousands in seconds when necessary, without having the programmer knowing where they were being spun up. So you know, completely transparent to the programmer. And we then had a controller, so through Leviathan, which would go in and monitor the networking traffic. It would monitor layer two and layer three traffic from all of these nodes, and then set up and tear down connections based on these machines. And what you do is you could optimize your traffic for bandwidth or for latency. So did you need to move a lot of data? Or did you need to move it fast? And so, so you, know, you had two containers in two completely separate parts of the world communicating a lot with each other. You'd go in and you'd set up your own connection between them. So all automated. So there was nothing. It was all taken away from the hands of the programmer. And you know, give you examples of use cases. You know, we were amassing huge amounts of data. You want to do some you know, MapReduce computations on your data. What you do, you can either move the data and then analyze it, or you can actually move the compute to the data. So you know, that was one of the ideas around it. And uh, again, you know, it, it's thinking massive concurrency, but massive concurrency on a VM scale. And yeah, use cases include big data, cloud, edge, fog computing, and many, many others. Um, again, uh, with the whole thought around aut automatization. Uh, all the source code is still available as open source. This project now um, is, not, you know, is not moving forward, but you know, they had really, really impressive results as a result of it. And you know, fast forward a few years from there, another of the hypes we've had to live through, or are still living through, is that of containerization. And you know, the idea that you can actually orchestrate containers is very, very much tightly coupled to the Beam way of thinking. Uh, but you know, have containers actually taken us back a step? You know, think about it. Um, one of the examples here is, for example, think of error recovery. And you know, think of how error recovery handles it. And Fred Haber, you know, there's an onion there, and Fred Haber has a blog post which kind of describes Erlang's error recovery mechanisms and Elixirs as well as, a, um, as layers. In the, in the very, very center, you've got you know, error recovery for sequential programming. So that means you try catch, and you try to catch your exceptions and deal with them. If that fails, you then go in and you actually encapsulate everything in a process, and the process terminates. No shared state, so your data won't get corrupt. You've got supervisors monitoring the processes, you know, level up. Supervisor will go in and restart that process. You then package. And, and the supervisor, you package supervision trees into applications. And the application might itself go in and terminate. And so, and if the application terminates, you know, your next level is on a virtual machine level. So, you know, this is all of the error recovery, which, right here, which Erlang has given you by default for the last 25 years. Now, think of the lower ones. You've got Kubernetes, which, is a supervisor. What does Kubernetes do? It restarts containers. It starts them, it stops them, it pauses them. And your Kubernetes sends messages to Docker, instructing it to start. Um, have you seen it all before? Are you getting another sense of deja vu right here? And again, you know, we have an operating system on top of the operating system. You know, do we really need containers? Um, you know, this is still early days, what we're seeing happening here. But it's actually you know, bringing us back to what we were doing with flow forwarding. It's a very kind of similar concept. And you know, the only difference is with flow forwarding, we had a team of three or four, maybe five developers. <laughs> You know, doing all of that. If you look at you know everyone working, you know around containerization, around Kubernetes, it's a, you know, the investments are much much larger, but the ideas are very much there. And you know, if you think of it, the real positive thing with Kubernetes and containers 
is that they've contributed in the whole movement towards cloud native. So making sure that you know, you're not stuck on a particular provider and that you can actually migrate you know, from cloud provider to cloud provider, you know, to private cloud and whatnot. And it's, uh, you know, it's actually, um, could Erlang or Alexia actually, you know, be part of this orchestration, you know, of starting off the containers, t tearing them down, enhancing and extending Kubernetes itself? I think, you know, there are libraries in Elixir which allow you to do that today. And, you know, Erlang and Elixir, they're both excellent at handling and manipulating state, you know. And again, it's the right tool for the job. Um, what is Kubernetes written in today? Go. And uh, it's, uh, sorry? And bash. bash, yes. And hopefully, you know, we should start looking at, you know, creating wrappers around it. With, with, with Erlang and, uh, well, with Erlang and Elixir. And that's already happening. We're seeing that happen right now, uh, you know, to bypass some of the issues. Now, I've, I've been talking about, you know, the, the, the past and to where we are today, but, you know, where, you know, where's the future taking us? Um, this is, well, again, one of my favorite quotes from Alan Kay. And we were fortunate enough to have Alan Kay talk at one of our conferences, and he admitted, you know, Joe Armstrong was interviewing him and asking, you come up with such great quotes, you know, why, you know, where do you get your inspiration? And Alan Kay's response was, oh, you know, when we were back at, um, you know, back at Xerox Labs, uh, we realized management loved these, these quotes. <laughs> they, they, they lived on them, so we were actually making them up just to get them off our backs and keep them happy. <laughs> So sorry for this you know, kind of breaking an image, but you know, uh, you know. The, 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 uh, but as I say, you know, the best way to predict the future is to invent it, and I think I, I kind of agree with it. And you know, where's the future taking us? You know, my view right here is you know cloud native applications, where we want the developers actually abstracting away from the complexities of orchestration. The, 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 you don't want the developers to actually worry about that. You don't want them to worry about the underlying hardware and network layers. They need to be optimized for your use case. Uh, never again do I want to spin off uh, yours and Sung and not being able to push the, the, the web service beyond 100% CPU. You know, that, 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 that's completely out of it. And you know, thinking about this, I mean, this is where you know, we've come up with what we call, what I call at least an OSI model for distributed computing. You know, we need to maybe find a better name for it. Where, you know, we looked at all of these components, and these are all components I've spoken about today. On, you know, the very bottom we've got the not networking layer, on top of which we've got the operating system. We've got virtual machines. So virtual machines could be, again, you know, uh, containers. They could be um, virtualization. It could be language VMs, so it could be the Beam as well. We've got distributed topologies, so distributed architectures. And we have on top of that, you know, programming languages, programming models, which we apply on top of the programming languages. And on the very, very top, we've got the application layers. And in my ideal world, you know, when you're designing the new Twitter or the new Facebook, or, you know, taking the Phoenix framework and right, doing something really, really cool on it, you should only be focusing on the application layer. You should be writing code which takes care of a single user, of a single instance, of a single process, of a single session, and you let the underlying layers... Yeah, and you do that, by the way, using a prediction particular programming model. So examples of programming models include the actor model. They could include lambdas, but not lambdas as we know them today in Amazon, but state, state, stateful lambdas. So you get short snippets of code, but when that code gets called, you also get a state passed to it. Because you've got lambdas, you still need to do all the I.O. to go to a database. You, pill up, you know, pull out data which you might need. So actually, you know, using a particular state, you know, which, which gets passed to it. Could be event-driven, uh, you know, domain-driven design. So, you know, functional reactive, you know, pub-sub, you know, pub-sub, I think, is 
a very underestimated but, but you know, very widely used uh, programming model. You know, just going back here for PubSub, PubSub is being used MongoseM and XMPP messaging server. Um, instant messaging, it's PubSub. RabbitMQ, AMQP messaging server, it's PubSub. VernMQ or EMQ, again MQTT, it's PubSub. So it, it, it's, it's absolutely everywhere, but you know, we don't quite realize it. And so, yeah, all of this is just the tip of the iceberg. And that's really what you should be worrying about uh, as developers. And let others you know, worry about all the underlying layers. Um, you know, when it comes to you know, the underlying layers, you know, include you know, topologies. So RIA Core, you know, how many of you attended the RIA Core tutorial yesterday? Quite a few of you, yes. So imagine you know, developing on RIA Core and then realizing that this is great, but your know, systems don't need to scale to this level. So you want to swap off RIA Core with a fully meshed architecture consisting of two nodes. You know, if you start having very strict APIs in between these layers, that's going to be possible. And then, so you just go in and you swap it. Uh, on a virtual machine level, uh, it doesn't matter if you're running in JVM, if you're running the Beam or Ling or any other VM. If, you know, the JVM, I'll give you an example. I mean, JVM, there's Erjang, which is Erlang running on the JVM, and also, you know, they've managed to get Elixir running as well. Um, floating point operations in Erjang are a thousand percent faster than in the Beam. A thousand times faster. I mean, th that, that's why Java and the JVM is used for uh, data sciences, yeah. Some aspects of data sciences, of course. Um, so, again, you know, for number crunching. And, and then, you know, down OS and network. You know, and, and the reason, you know, we're struggling today in actually getting something, you know, in, in reusing is that we end up fudging all of these different layers. We end up mixing these different layers together. Um, as an example, React Core is mixing programming languages and topologies and is bound to a particular VM. And so, yeah, you can use React Core, you know, for, you know, you know but, again, you're limited to particular use cases. So it's great for certain use cases. And, you know, I gave an example of um, the Flow Forward program, the Flow Forward um, project where you know, we took the living VM. What we did there, in effect, was we integrated the VM, the operating system, and the network. We integrated these three layers and pushed them out. And we actually, you know, we also integrated the topology and the programming languages because the topology was, would mainly become a uh, kind of peer-to-peer -peer distributed topology. Where we would set up and tear down communications based on the needs, optimizing. Them, and you could only do it in Erlang or Elixir, and not anything else. You, you're following me here, yeah. So, you know, what, what, in my mind, what does the future hold? Well, software needs to be cloud native. At least, you know, that's the buzzword of what we've been doing. Even though, you know, before the cloud happened, we used the Beam or the Jam, which made us platform independent, so we could run on Windows machines as well as Solaris, Linux, or OS X. Vendor independence is really, really important. Uh, don't you know, get tie in into a particular vendor. And you know, if you all have a lesson to take home from today, is you know, when, when you're moving forward, when you're architecting your systems, start thinking in terms of these layers. They're abstraction layers. Um, you know, it's abstractions are always good if they're not. Yeah, if they're at the right level. Think in terms of these abstraction layers, and don't worry too much about you know, having the perfect layers, but if you start creating these abstraction layers, it will be very easy later on to actually swap out, you know, swap out these layers with something which, you know, which will evolve as your product, you know, which your building is evolving as well. And yeah, th th that basically allows you, you know, to you know, also go in and create reusable software, which will hopefully go out and release as open source, so others can go in and use it. 
and, and, and that's my real, you know, that's my real hope, you know. I know, you know, at least we, you know, uh, with my colleagues, have been talking about this for a long time, and we're actually looking for funding uh, from the EU. We're applying for EU grants, you know, one after the other, but we're actually struggling to explain this to the, to the EU bu bureaucrats right now. I think they've got other things on their mind, but uh, maybe you know, next time we do apply for one of these grants, which will be in March, we'll send a copy of this video <laughs> and help them understand it. <laughs> Maybe adding it out the word bureaucrats, but yes. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, this is where I believe we're heading, where, yeah, we're, we're basically hiding the bottom part of the iceberg from the developers. And whilst doing that, we're also making sure that you know, the ice caps don't melt and that we use less computing power as needed. Yeah. Any questions? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> No. I'll, yes. Uh, a little bit of context for my question is like, there is a small subset of us people working in the cloud native space who share your vision on particularly about Kubernetes, for example, that, and I was talking to someone last night about this, that our vision is like someday, and we hope in the near future, that Kubernetes is still a thing, mm -hmm. but a thing that isn't, that developers don't have to interact with directly. Yeah. Like, we don't know yet what that is, like an application yeah. or a system, but like, definitely something that manages as you yeah. said it, but without having to worry about all the things that, that we have to deal with right now. Yeah. So, with that in mind, as I said, we don't know how will that look like? Do you have a specific idea on how it would look like? We've got many ideas. And um, yeah, it, it's, we, we're putting in place, we've put in place probably four research grants uh, trying to solve this problem. And it's a mixture. If, you go, if we go back a few, if we go back on the, at the various layers, you know, what, what we do is, say on the programming model layer, um, as a suggestion, you know, we're looking at, you know, one university, the University of Innsbruck, was suggesting we actually use static analysis to analyze the code and figure out, you know, and, and on, a, on a callback level. So for each client function, you've got callbacks. Analyzing the code and understanding what type of CPU capacity do we need, what type of processor do you need. You know, if you think of your know, multi-core, it's, uh, you know, the multi-cores aren't homogeneous anymore, they're all heterogeneous. You've got cores for absolutely everything. Um, and so figuring out, you know, what, you know, should we run this on a GPU? You know, should we run this on a SOC, a software on, you know, on a chip? Should we run this uh, on a regular, you know, on, you know, on just regular cores? And then redirecting the requests that way. So that, that's, one, you know, that's one of the things they've looked at. Others include uh, kind of live benchmarking, so applying software-defined networking principles, looking at you know, measuring benchmarking. You know, how long does it take if we executed in, and that's where you know, Chris Makeljohn used to do a lot of work. You know, what happens if we execute it on, um, yep. <laughs> uh, what, happens if, you know, what happens if we use it, so you know, the, his team, you know, we, you know, we're actually now putting a proposal with them. What happens if you've got, you know, what's, what's cheaper? You know, your phone gathers a lot of data. Should we process the data on your phone? Should we process it in, in the actual base stations? So you might not have enough power, so we process it on the base station, the radio base stations, to avoid the transport costs. Or do we send it back to, you know, and that's edge computing, do we send it back to the cloud, you know, for, you know, and actually, you know, process it there. And so in real time, measure. Several, at least two programming languages have been invented uh, from, by people uh, from Brazil, like Lua, like mm -hmm. Elixir. Lua and? Elixir. Elixir, yeah. And uh, I see that there's uh, a lot of work, uh, a, lot, a lot of people that are really good uh, and that are pushing forward uh, the community, mm -hmm. the tools, uh, 
Or do you think this is happening from Brazil and not from any other country in South America? Is it maybe? It's a very hard question. Uh, <laughs> because I, what, so I've never been to Brazil. Um, I've met a lot of people from the Brazilian community. I know, you know that I, I know that um, you know Simon Thompson, for example, uh, which is very active in the Ireland community, formerly from Haskell, you know, has done a lot of research in Brazil. He's actually lived there, and you know I, it's uh, you need innovation, you know, to, to to drive things forward, and you need to think out of the box. Um, you need to have people ready, you know, to call you crazy. <laughs> Uh, you know, to, to actually move things forward. So, you know, that, that, that's my, and, and hearing, you know, what's actually happening with Elixir in Brazil um, is, you know, sounds very, very promising. But I really don't know, you know, um, very, you know, much, I, I can't, you know, go into the details because... No, and no, I just realized I yeah. mixed up your nationality. I'm sorry. I, no, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I can tell you what's happening in Italy, <laughs> but, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. One more? Uh -huh. Yeah. And what is the status of, of on the beam to make a, to make it faster? I knew that you were working with making a a, a jeep mm -hmm. with LLBM. What is the status of on that? On That's going to be released probably in the next twelve months. So it's Lucas Larson, which is an airline solutions employee, who's uh -huh. been working on it. So they've actually set a date, and they're going to release it as not as a product, but yeah, as a as a uh, proof of concept, as a, as a prototype right now, and start getting feedback. But if we look at the JIT, the biggest challenge, um, g again, going back to 1997, the very first version of the Beam was actually called Turbo Erlang, and what it did was. The Beam VM, what it did was it took Erlang code, sequential Erlang code, and compiled it to C. And you know they got a tenfold, ten times increase in performance on sequential code. Then all of a sudden, they went in and started running a, a, a concurrent application on it, and that advantage disappeared completely. It disappeared completely because the programs you're all writing are not sequential. Yeah, they're all concurrent. And so, you know, I think, you know, w there's going to be a lot of issues, you know, or not issues, but disappointments when you, know, you think that everything's going to run much, much faster. Yes, your sequential code will. But at the end of the day, it's, it's you know, you're not writing sequential code, you're writing massively concurrent code. And so, you know, the, the real way to make it fast is down on a VM level, uh, optimizing as much as possible. And we're seeing, you know, these optimizations, really soft release uh, happening. You know, I mean, the OTTP team is doing a fantastic job. And they're doing it without breaking backwards compatibility. Yes? But number crunching will run fast. Number crunching will run fast. But if you want a number crunch today, use Julia, use Rust, and use NIFS. But we, we will get less comments on yeah. the, um, News. Mm. <laughs> Micro benchmarks, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you actually see my computer here. Um, just to leave you with some food for four, my actual computer here is called Ramon. I'm a big Ramon's fan. I know I've seen here in, in Colombia probably seven or eight t shirts with the Ramones on. And as you know, the Ramones were in the background, you're setting the beat. Uh, for a lot of other bands, which you know became much much bigger than them, and I've always kind of called Ramon uh, Erlang, you know, the Ramones of the programming languages. <laughs> it's in the background, you know, providing the constructs and the ways forward, you know, which all the mainstream languages are now picking up. So, listen, thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed. Yeah, you know, thank you. And